Um, I want to thank you for the invitation. So uh, today I'm going to talk about minimally invasive rectal cancer surgery, and I'm going to include broad in the topic and, and just have a couple of slides on local excision because that is, in essence, another minimally invasive technique. So everybody knows this, the earliest lesions um, we can treat with local excision, but very selectively, more advanced need multimodality therapy. So what about what's, what's local excision? So here we go through the rectum and we take a disc of tissue out around the polyp or the mass or the tumor, and we can take out the tumor entirely, full thickness rectal wall, but we don't address the local regional lymph nodes. This is a typical sort of early lesion we see. This is a, an ultrasound image. This is the submucosa, this white line that breaks. This is probably a T1 lesion. And you can take it out transanally or transendoscopic microsurgery, so-called that TEM, which some people feel is a little bit better. Um, and we were doing this for quite a while. The reports came out over 10 years ago giving us some pause because the local recurrence rates were higher than we would expect. This is a study from Sloan Kettering, but there were other studies even before this from Minnesota and other major centers showing that for what is thought to be early stage rectal cancer, a T1 lesion with a local excision, local recurrence rates approaching 15%, for T2 lesions, 26%. Um, this is also, uh, and these are the overall recurrence rates. So these are much higher than we would ever expect if indeed these are N0 lesions. If this is T1 N0, of course, the outcome should be 95% uh, cure. Even if we do this transanal uh, endoscopic microsurgery, which is a newer technique thought to be better, Local recurrence rates of 10% are really just too high. Uh, and if we actually do a head-to-head -head comparison retrospectively, looking at patients that have total mesorectal excision, let's say if we're looking at local recurrence versus transanal excision, uh, it's much higher if you're going to get a transanal excision. And so we have to take pause and really discuss with patients if we're gonna do a transanal excision. If it's an extremely low lesion, good risk factors, no lymphovascular invasion, very early invasion into the submucosa, then a transanal excision may be worth it if you're gonna avoid an abdominal perineal resection. But a lesion in the mid-rectum, I think, should be treated with total mesorectal excision. You should avoid local excision in the healthy uh, patient. And the problem with, with local excisions is that the recurrences aren't easy to find. They're usually not luminal. This is a typical type of recurrence. This is an MRI of the pelvis. Here it is. It's deep to the wall. It has to grow to be seen on MRI. Uh, and this is probably a lymph node. This is a, a lymph node that grew over five, uh, uh, over many years. This is a, a recurrence of 28 months. Now, what about... Uh, T2 lesions. I, I just want to quickly talk about the ACASOG Z6041 protocol. This is a higher risk tumor, a T2 lesion that we generally have abandoned local excision for. The recurrence rates approach 25 to 35 percent. And in this study, a phase two uh, T2N0 lesions uh, received radiation and chemotherapy, then local excision. Uh, if they had a good response, they were observed, and if they had more extensive disease than anticipated, they were advised to go, uh, to undergo total mesorectal excision and then follow up. This is a study led by Dr. Uh, Julio Garcia Aguilar, now at Sloan Kettering. And what we find, and there's many messages here, uh, that the response rate to chemo radiation for early lesions is tremendous. 55% had, in essence, a complete response to chemoradiation. And this goes along with the Habergama data uh, and other data in which uh, early lesions are much more responsive to chemoradiation than later lesions. So one possible alternative without stage, uh, without um, uh, uh, a very good evidence, but, but at least phase two evidence, is that for a very low rectal cancer, you can consider preoperative chemotherapy and then maybe local excision. And these are the, um, 
the disease-free survival curves. But let's get on to the main topic, and that's uh, minimally invasive or laparoscopic robotic colorectal surgery. The whole idea is to avoid trauma, to avoid a large incision, to get quicker recovery, and hopefully have less complications. This is a bit of a complicated uh, chart, but it's really just color-coded. These are the major colon trials, large prospective randomized trials. These are the outcomes, and you can see here in orange that most of these trials favor laparoscopy. Quicker recovery, uh, shorter length of stay, uh, good patient satisfaction. It does take longer, so that may favor open, and all the other endpoints oncologically were equivalent. So we can do for colon cancer the same operation laparoscopically, and we can uh, have the patients recover quicker. I'm sure everybody here has seen that. This has become standard. And this was very easy. Once we started to see the good results, the uptake was immediate. This is using NCDB uh, data. It's not perfect data, but I think it shows the point. Laparoscopic right hemicolectomy between 2007 and 2009 rose dramatically. Same thing with a sigmoid resection. Uh, it was a good operation uh, with good results. But what about this? This is a rectal cancer extending to the circumferential radial margin. It's in a narrow pelvis. Uh, it's surrounded by blood vessels and nerves that control sexual and bladder function. Can we do this laparoscopically? Would we expect the same results? And uh, looking back at the same paper uh, at NCDB data from 2007 to 2009, when we saw this increase in laparoscopic approaches to right hemicolectomy and sigmoid, we didn't see a real change in low anterior resection. That is, we weren't approaching rectal resections to any significant degree with minimally invasive approaches. And why is this? Well, maybe there's a limited amount of prospective randomized data, and that's holding people back. Uh, the other reason uh, that I think may be uh, more relevant is that proctectomy is a much more challenging procedure than colectomy. Once again, you have to preserve the nerves. Uh, you need an exact dissection on the mesorectal fascia. You have to worry about the radial circumferential margin. When you're working laparoscopically in a small space, your instruments are colliding continuously. You don't have a lot of maneuverability, uh, and retraction is a challenge. Well, let's, let's try to attack these one by one. Is there data? So this is uh, meta-analysis from small, single institution, randomized control trials. And uh, you can just see from the forest plots that overall survival, disease-free survival, local recurrence, resection margins are all the same. So you can do this laparoscopically in very skilled hands. That is, you have some data to prove that oncologically it's safe. And there are now a number of large prospective randomized trials worldwide being performed. The ACASOG Z6051, that's the U.S. study that has closed, should be published soon. The color two will be, the final results will be published, I believe, in New England Journal within uh, a few months. Uh, and, but what we do have, although the long-term data is about to be published, the short-term data shows oncologic equivalence. So in very experienced hands, expert surgeons, you can do this laparoscopically. This is a typical sort of data from the color two. Laparoscopic rectal resection versus open. Uh, the laparoscopic approach takes longer, 240 minutes versus 188. But complication rates, complete TME resection, post uh, positive uh, circumferential radial margin is the same. So in expert hands, you can do it. Uh, there's a, a shorter length of stay, and this is very similar to what we see, although it doesn't seem like a lot. One day is the best that you would expect in, say, reduction of ileus. But the conversion rate, the that is, the inability to complete the procedure laparoscopically was 17%. And these are the best of the best surgeons. So these are people that have been vetted, that do high volume surgery, and even in these terms, uh, pushing uh, one in uh, five operations have to be opened to the regular approach. The problem, and, and we had seen this before, this is an older, uh, called the classic study, a, an older laparoscopic trial that included rectal and colon. The conversion rates here were between 30 and 40 percent until the last year of the study when they finally were able to pick the right patients and the conversion rate went down. The problem with conversion is that it's a long procedure. 
so if we look at the classic study, uh, conversion uh, is as long as straight lap, so you get no benefit uh, of open surgery. In the classic study, if you had to convert, then you had the longest ileus, the longest hospitalization, and the longest complication. So in general, it's something you want to avoid. If you have to convert, it generally prolongs the whole stay. And what, what do we see in, in surgeons out there doing the operation? If we look at conversion to open surgery, as we got better at laparoscopic colectomy, conversion rates went down, 27% to 11, 30 to 13. But for the, average surgeon out do, uh, for the average surgeon out there doing the average volume, the conversion rate over time did not change. And, it, it, and in the average surgeon, it's, almost, it's over 40%. So I would say that laparoscopic rectal surgery is difficult. It's limited by the confines of the pelvis. Uh, it's especially hard in obese patients, male patients, and low-lying tumors. And if we look, uh, and I don't provide the data, conversion rates are higher in that subgroup. And in general, it's not being performed uh, very often. So this has led to alternative approaches. One of these is an, a hybrid approach where you combine laparoscopic and open techniques. You start laparoscopically, you take down the vessels and maybe the splenic flexure, and then you make a low-line incision and do the pelvic dissection through an open technique. Uh, another approach, uh, this is being done in Spain uh, and in Europe, uh, is a bottom-up approach where you actually do a transanal TME and then you do laparoscopy from above. This is a very complex procedure. Uh, and uh, until you become expert at it, the nerves as well as the ureters are at high risk as well as, as uh, infecting the pelvis. So this is a, a complex way to go as well. So that's where I think the robot comes in in the robotic platform. So what are the benefits of the robot? Uh, it has articulating arms uh, that work very well in the small uh, space of the pelvis. The visualization is improved with 3D graphics, stable camera platform, better retraction, and better stapling in the pelvis. And I'll just show a, a little bit of a, a video. Let's see. There we go. So we're looking into the pelvis. Here's the rectum. Here's uh, the posterior part of the TME. And we're operating with, with two instruments that articulate. And I'm going right along the mesorectal fascia. The nerve is right here. This is the, the autonomic nerve that's going into the pelvis. And of course, if there's tumor extending to that margin, you have to take the visceral layer of the endopelvic fascia and maybe sacrifice the nerve. Here's the nerve right over here. And so we're going to push that nerve back and dissect right on the mesorectal fascia. And you can see this is a male narrow pelvis. So the, he's 40. He got preoperative chemo radiation. And in fact, we took a portion of the capsule of the prostate uh, because he had uh, such uh, locally advanced disease. So uh, just an example, I think, of what we can do with uh, robotic surgery. Well, what about the data? There's, you know, not surprisingly, an abundance of non-randomized retrospective case series, and, uh, which is all biased. Uh, and then these have been further put together in big meta-analyses. So I'll run through these because it's just, there's not a lot of data out there, but it is what we have. This is an interesting study, uh, and this is the typical sort of thing that you have out there. You're comparing open versus laparoscopic versus robotic rectal resection. And as you go to minimally invasive techniques, the surgery becomes longer, and this is true, I think. In most scenarios, minimally invasive surgery takes longer. But generally, uh, the blood loss is less probably because more precise uh, um, dissection, less retracting. Uh, complication rates tend to be a little bit less wound infections, length of stay is less. So these are uh, indicating that there is uh, some uh, benefit. So uh, where else does uh, the robotic surgery help? And I think that's conversion to open surgery. So right hemicolectomy and sigmoid resections, we can do these laparoscopically very well. It's straightforward. The low anterior resection, we see a benefit. Here's the robotic surgery. A drop in conversion significantly when you use the robotic uh, technology. Looking at the, uh, well, what about if we look at robotic versus laparoscopic? Uh, and these are the multiple meta-analyses that are out there. Blood loss, operative time, complications, length of stay, margins, lymph node yield. 
that's all equivalent. You get the same if you do it laparoscopic or robotic. The big one in this force plot here is conversion. There's significantly less conversion with robotic surgery. It doesn't appear to be affected by uh, body habitus, obesity, or low-lying tumors, uh, even ones that are within five centimeters of the anal verge. And, uh, and this is, I think, a, a huge benefit. You can, and we were talking about this, there's a grading system now uh, by, uh, that's, uh, uh, in essence, endorsed by CAP or the American College of Pathologists uh, that will grade the quality of the TME, and it, seems, uh, and it seems that robotically you're able to precisely dissect out the mesorectum uh, uh, and get a good quality uh, dissection in the majority of cases. There's some very preliminary data indicating that, that nerve injury uh, is low, sexual function and voiding uh, dysfunction. Uh, and learning curve, um, there's some indication that the learning curve is shorter with robotic surgery. This is an interesting study where you compared uh, an institution's first 50 uh, laparoscopic surgeries to their first 50 robotic. There's a lot of flaws in the study because obviously the robotic came after the laparoscopic, but you could see that the chance of getting a positive circumferential margin or converting to an open surgery is less with robotic surgery, all pointing to the fact that we can do the surgery probably more easily robotically. This is a typical sort of learning curve uh, graph that we show that uh, the number of cases is shown uh, here on the x-axis in operative time on the y-axis, and with time, you become better as you get higher up on your learning curve. However, with laparoscopic surgery, it's so difficult that there really is no learning curve. Each case is different and has its own challenges. Cost, there's just no doubt that the robotic platform costs money and it costs more. So I'll summarize to say that uh, local excision uh, uh, either standard transanal or transanal endoscopic microsurgery really should be limited to superficial T1 lesions that don't have any poor features or those patients that are medically unfit that can't undergo major resection. We use an SM grading, which indicates how deep the tumor is growing into the, uh, the submucosa. SM1 is the most superficial, no lymphovascular or perineural invasion, and well to moderately differentiated tumors. With regard to minimally invasive colon and rectal surgery, I think this is associated with quicker recovery. This has been shown in multiple uh, studies now. Laparoscopic rectal resection is a difficult procedure. It's demanding high conversion rates, and therefore the adoption is low. There are some surgeons, and these may be your surgeons, that can do this. They may be so expert that they can do it, and that's fine. The majority of surgeons need the help, I think, of the robot. Um, we will have to see in ongoing studies, and there are some that are out there now, to see if uh, the enhanced recovery actually translates into improved oncologic outcome, tolerance of adjuvant treatment, things like that. Uh, but it is, this, these surgeries do require expertise. Open rectal resection is still very acceptable, especially if your local surgeon uh, is expert at that and not expert at minimally invasive surgery. Thank you very much.